Here are 10 quotes from the mind of Paul Adrian Maurice Dirac. One, on the beauty of an equation. From Scientific American, May 1963, Paul says, I might tell you the story I heard from Schrodinger of how, when he first got the idea for this equation, he immediately applied it to the behavior of the electron in the hydrogen atom. And then he got the results that did not agree with the experiment. The disagreement arose because at that time it was not known that the electron has spin. That, of course, was a great disappointment to Schrodinger, and it caused him to abandon the work for some months. Then he noticed that if he applied the theory in a more approximate way, not taking into account the refinements required by relativity, to this rough approximation his work was in agreement with observation. He published his first paper with only this rough approximation. In that way, Schrodinger's wave equation was presented to the world. Afterward, of course, when people found out how to take into account correctly the spin of the electron, the discrepancy between the results of applying Schrodinger's relativistic equation and the experiments was completely cleared up. I think that there is a moral to this story, namely, that it is more important to have beauty in one's equations than to have them fit experiment. If Schrodinger had been more confident of his work, he could have published it some months earlier, and he could have published a more accurate equation. It seems that if one is working from the point of view of getting beauty in one's equations, and if one has really a sound insight, one is on a sure line of progress. If there is not complete agreement between the results of one's work and experiment, one should not allow oneself to be too discouraged because the discrepancy may well be due to minor features that are not properly taken into account and that will get cleared up with the further development of the theory. Two, on quantum mechanics. In Albert Einstein, Historical and Cultural Perspectives of 1979, Dirac said, it seems clear that the present quantum mechanics is not in its final form. Some further changes will be needed just about as drastic as the changes made in passing from Bohr's orbit theory to quantum mechanics. Someday, a new quantum mechanics, a relativistic one, will be discovered, in which we will not have these infinities occurring at all. It might very well be that the new quantum mechanics will have determinism in the way that Einstein wanted. Number three on the theory of relativity. From a lecture delivered on the presentation of the James Scott Prize in 1939, Paul says, what makes the theory of relativity so acceptable to physicists in spite of its going against the principle of simplicity is its great mathematical beauty. This is a quality which cannot be defined any more than beauty in art can be defined, but which people who study mathematics usually have no difficulty in appreciating. The restricted theory changed our ideas of space and time in a way that may be summarized by stating that the group of transformations to which space-time continuum is subject must be changed from the Galilean group to the Lorentz group. Number four, on the laws of nature. From the relation between mathematics and physics in 1939, Dirac says, at the beginning of time, the laws of nature were probably very different from what they are now. Thus, we should consider the laws of nature as continually changing with the epoch, instead of as holding uniformly throughout space-time. This idea was first put forth by Milne, who worked it out on assumptions, not very satisfying. We should expect them also to depend on position in space in order to preserve the beautiful idea of the theory of relativity, that there is fundamental similarity between space and time. Number five on protons and electrons. Quoted from Graham Farmello's The Strangest Man, Dirac gives the analogy for the subatomic particles saying, when you ask what are electrons and protons, I ought to answer that this question is not a profitable one to ask and does not really have a meaning. The important thing about electrons and protons is not what they are, but how they behave, how they move. I can describe the situation by comparing it to a game of chess. In chess, we have various chessmen, kings, knights, pawns, and so on. If you ask what a chessman is, the answer would be that it is a piece of wood, or a piece of ivory, or perhaps just a sign written on paper, or anything, whatever. It does not matter. Each chessman has a characteristic way of moving, and this is all that matters about it. The whole game of chess follows from this way of moving the various chessmen. 
Number six on mathematics. In The Evolution of the Physicist's Picture of Nature, 1963, Dirac says, it seems to be one of the fundamental features of nature that fundamental physical laws are described in terms of a mathematical theory of great beauty and power, needing quite a high standard of mathematics for one to understand it. You may wonder, why is nature constructed along these lines? One can only answer that our present knowledge seems to show that nature is so constructed. We simply have to accept it. One could perhaps describe the situation by saying that God is a mathematician of a very high order, and he used very advanced mathematics in constructing the universe. Our feeble attempts at mathematics enable us to understand a bit of the universe, and as we proceed to develop higher and higher mathematics, we can hope to understand the universe better. Number seven, contrast of mathematical and general beauty. In one of his lectures, Dirac says, it is quite clear that beauty does depend on one's culture and upbringing for certain kinds of beauty, pictures, literature, poetry, and so on. But mathematical beauty is of a rather different kind. I should say, perhaps it is of a completely different kind and transcends these personal factors. It is the same in all countries and at all periods of time. Number eight, on revelation from a Life of Physics, Evening Lectures at the International Center for Theoretical Physics in 1968, Dirac says, I found the best ideas usually came not when one is actively striving for them, but when one was in a more relaxed state. I used to take long, solitary walks on Sunday, during which I tended to review the current situation in a leisurely way. Such occasions often proved fruitful, even though, or perhaps because, the primary purpose of the walk was relaxation and not research. Number nine, on pure mathematics and physics. From a lecture in 1939, Dirac expresses, pure mathematics and physics are becoming ever more closely connected, though their methods remain different. One may describe the situation by saying that the mathematician plays a game in which he himself invents the rules, while the physicist plays a game in which the rules are provided by nature. But as time goes on, it becomes increasingly evident that the rules which the mathematician finds interesting are the same as those which nature has chosen. Possibly, the two subjects will ultimately unify, every branch of pure mathematics then having its physical application, its importance in physics being proportional to its interest in mathematics. Number 10 on being humble. As quoted in The Strangest Man of 2009 by Graham Farmello, Dirac says, If you are receptive and humble, mathematics will lead you by the hand. Again and again, when I have been at a loss how to proceed, I have just had to wait until I have felt the mathematics led me by the hand. It has led me along an unexpected path where new vistas open up, a path leading to new territory, where one can set up a base of operations from which one can survey the surroundings and plan future progress. And we thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe for more interesting facts about our work.